Atlanta, Georgia is one of the most modern metropolitan communities in the world, and one of its symbols is Atlanta Stadium, home of the football Falcons, Georgia's proud representative among the color, glamour, and pageantry of the National Football League. Following their first winning season in 1971, the Falcons entered 1972 as a contender for the title in the NFC West and proved that they were indeed a team on the way up as they finished in second place, the highest standing in their seven-year history and just a step away from their first championship. The setting for the season's opening game was Chicago's Soldier Field, where for coach Norm Van Brocklin's Falcons, two new starters immediately made their presence felt. First, number 69, Mike Lewis, caused a fumble, which John Zook quickly turned into the season's first touchdown. And then came the debut of a new running back, former Green Bay Packer Dave Hampton, number 43. Quarterback Bob Berry threw only nine passes, but two went for touchdowns to wide receiver Ken Burrow and to fullback Art Malone as the Falcons rolled up a club record 31 points in the first half and breezed past the Bears 37 to 21. The next week in New England, Art Malone and Dave Hampton continued to roll this time accounting for well over 300 yards of total offense between them as the Falcons ran up a 20 to 7 lead after three quarters. Then came one of the strangest finishes ever. Jim Plunkett passed the Patriots to a one point lead and then as time ran out the Falcons set up the winning field goal at the 10-yard line. The fourth down crew was back in form the next week as rookie John James continued to boom long punts. And Bill Bell booted a 41-yard field goal to open the scoring against Los Angeles in the Falcons' home opener. The rugged Ram defense was no match for the revved up Atlanta offense. Bob Berry connected with Ken Burrow for one touchdown that was called back and for one more that counted in the record books. Art Malone and Dave Hampton each accounted for more than 100 yards on the ground. Malone banged ahead for 103 while his partner, Dave Hampton, broke loose for 161 spectacular yards. It was a great day for the Atlanta running game, for the unsung heroes who opened the holes, and for the backs who poured through those holes. It was also a great day for the Atlanta defense, which came up with a club record six interceptions. Falcons, it was their first victory over Los Angeles in 12 tries, and they did it in style, 31 to 3. It was, in the words of Coach Norm Van Brocklin, our most satisfying victory. 
but a victory which could be savored only until the following Sunday, when the Detroit Lions exploded on the scene for a seesaw battle, reminiscent of the 41-38 cliffhanger of the previous season. by 10 points after three quarters, the Falcons came back strong in the fourth quarter to take the lead 23 to 20. Then came a second weird finish in an otherwise perfect season for the Falcons. For the second time in three weeks, an apparent come from behind victory suddenly became a depressing defeat, 26 to 23. Week five found the Falcons in New Orleans where their ill fortune continued. The Saints dashed to a 14-point lead in the first quarter, but Bob Berry brought the Falcons back with three touchdown passes, including two to tight end Jim Mitchell, as Atlanta came from behind to win 21 to 14. From sunny New Orleans, the next stop was muddy Milwaukee where the division-leading Green Bay Packers ran up an early three-field goal lead. But again, Bob Barry brought the Falcons back as he hit on 11 of 18 third-down situations despite the deplorable conditions. Bill Bell kicked the winning field goal, and the Falcons were 4-2 and two for the season, and could have been 6-0 except for the weird finishes against New England and Detroit. But back home against San Francisco, it was more than just a weird finish which dealt the Falcons their third defeat. Vic Washington returned the opening kickoff 98 yards, the longest of the season. Steve Spurrier added three touchdown passes, and the 49ers had their first win in Atlanta in five years, 49 to 14. Then in Los Angeles, the Rams avenged their earlier 31 to 3 defeat by running over the Falcons 20 to 7. Heading into the second half of the season, the Falcons, who could have been in first place, were now second, a game and a half behind first place Los Angeles. Week number nine brought the rematch with the Saints, and this time the Falcons were more than ready. The offense would not settle for anything less than touchdowns, as Bob Berry, Ken Burrow, and the once again super-powered Falcon offense built a 30-point lead and then coasted to their seventh consecutive victory over New Orleans, 36 to 20. Next came a Monday night in Washington against the Super Bowl-bound Redskins of George Allen. The Falcons applied the early pressure when Bob Berry hit Jim Mitchell with a touchdown pass. The Redskins came back on the strong legs of Larry Brown. Brown gained his 1,000th yard of the season, but in 26 tries, he barely averaged three yards per carry against the fired-up Falcon defense. Despite being well worked over, Brown did manage to score two touchdowns as the Redskins came from behind to defeat the Falcons 24-13.
Back home the following Sunday, Charlie Johnson led the Denver Broncos to a 13 to nothing lead over the surprised Falcons. Two consecutive 15-yard penalties against Claude Humphrey aroused Humphrey, who then caught Johnson for a safety in the Falcons' first points of the game. The offense took it from there as Bob Berry connected on 13 of 16 attempts, including several clutch catches by Wes Chesson, who also scored the clinching touchdown as the Falcons once again came back to win 23-20. Next, the Houston Oilers tried their luck by putting the ball in the air 30 times against one of the league's toughest pass defenses. And the Falcons responded with five interceptions as Atlanta rolled past Houston 20 to 10. In San Francisco for the season's next to last week, the Falcons may have had the best game plan in history, but there's no way they could have been prepared for what was awaiting them. the Falcons could have wrapped up their first division title. Instead, four costly turnovers led to their first shutout in almost three years, as the 49ers won again 20 to nothing. The season's final game was like the season itself in microcosm. At first, the Falcons took command with an early lead over the Kansas City Chiefs. Then Lynn Dawson and Otis Taylor put Kansas City in front. Trailing by three in the third quarter, it was Ken Burrow's turn to put Atlanta ahead. Finally, on fourth down in the season's closing minutes, Ed Podolak scored to win the game for Kansas City. But there was another story to this game, the story of Dave Hampton. Although he had missed the equivalent of almost two full games, Hampton needed only 70 yards against Kansas City to reach the 1,000-yard mark. As Hampton himself said, it was something the whole team wanted me to get. We all worked for it. In the season's final game, Dave Hampton ran the 1,000th yard and was awarded the game ball, the Falcon of the Year Award, and a standing ovation. But then a slip, a bobbled pitch out, and the thousandth yard was lost. Dave Hampton, like the Atlanta Falcons, ended the season just a tantalizing step or so away. With the tough young veterans of the 1972 season, Coach Norm Van Brocklin's Falcons are ready to take that one final step to a championship. It all begins on defense, with a front four that is young and tough, and getting better game by game. At tackle, there was the steadying influence of number 88, Glenn Condren. At right tackle was number 69, quick second-year man Mike Lewis. And from St. Louis came number 79, the veteran Chuck Walker. And now, from Houston, comes number 78, 280-pound Mike Tilleman. With the Oilers in 72, Tilleman made 106 individual tackles, including 14 sacks of the quarterback, and was voted Houston's most valuable player. Coach Van Brocklin remembers Tilleman as the man who dropped his quarterback three times in one game. At 
defensive end, there was Claude Humphrey, number 87, a consensus all-pro, and his equally lethal partner, John Zook, number 71. As Coach Van Brocklin has said, we have the two best defensive ends in the NFL. They're a couple of tough little boys. In the secondary, the Falcons had a tough young pair of deep men in Ray Brown and top draft choice Clarence Ellis, number 29. At cornerback were the veteran Ken Reeves and second year man Tom Hayes, number 27. The Atlanta defense allowed a completion rate of only 45%, the best mark in the NFC. The linebacking core stayed healthy all year, which meant that veterans Grady Allen and Dwayne Benson didn't get much action. On the left side was number 58, reliable Don Hansen. On the right was rough and ready Greg Brezina, number 50. Tommy Novus, the original Falcon, was in the middle, playing the position as if he invented it. Against the run or against the pass, there is none better than old number 60. Tommy Novus made his fifth trip to the Pro Bowl and twice paid fines for throwing the ball into the stands. But as Coach Van Brocklin said, that's a cheap $200. The offensive line was both young and strong with number 56, Dennis Havig. Number 57, Jeff Van Note. Number 61, Bill Sandeman. Number 75, George Coons. And number 64, Andy Maurer. At quarterback was Bob Berry, who accounted for more than 2,000 yards passing and was listed among the conference leaders all year long. Norm Van Brocklin's passing offense was a careful blend of many elements, such as luring the defense in for the screen and carefully arching the ball over a charging lineman to a wide open screen man or faking the short throw and going for the end zone. The passing game involved five tough young receivers. One wide receiver was second year man Wes Chesson, number 81. Ken Burrow, another second year man, was the other wide receiver. And he's got everything that's necessary to be one of the game's best. of the scrimmage line comes the tight end and there is none better than number 86 pro bowler Jim Mitchell There 
were two other receivers who were instrumental in the success of the passing game. One was halfback Dave Hampton, number 43. The other was the team's leading receiver, fullback Art Malone, number 25. Excellent blocking eased the way for Art Malone and Dave Hampton. But to gain as much yardage as Dave Hampton did, a lot had to be done on his own. and Art Malone. Together, they were among the conference leaders in rushing and in teamwork. Together, they blocked for each other. And together, they carried the ball more than 500 times. And together, they gained more than 3,000 yards in total offense and scored 17 touchdowns for the 1972 Falcons. The 1972 Atlanta Falcons finished in second place in the NFC West. But unlike most of the NFL's other contending teams, the Falcons were a young team, a team which is bound to improve with experience. Perhaps the truest insight to the Falcons' future may be found by looking again at one game from their past, the home opener against Los Angeles. That one beautiful day was Camelot for the Atlanta faithful. But even more than that, that one beautiful day may very well have been the best indication of the future of the Atlanta Falcons. 